Listen for the word of God in the <clears throat> Listen for the word of God in Isaiah chapter 55 verses 1 through 9. Hey, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without a price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, your steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that you that do not know you shall run to, because of the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteousness their thoughts. Let them run to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than yours. Here ends the lesson. In life, we are very fortunate to be able to make choices. As Americans, we have an election process where we get to choose our leaders. We get to, I would say that for most of us, we get to choose what house we live in, what car we drive. I would even guess that for most of us, it's true that we get to choose, when we're hungry, we get to choose whether we want to eat out or at home. And if we eat at home, I'm guessing there's still a choice to be made as far as what we want to eat. Now, if you would ask my children, they would tell you that frequently there is no food in the house. What they're really saying is that they can't find the particular thing that they are hungry for. Because the pantry, the refrigerator, and the freezer all have food in them. One just has to cook. And they want something that they can grab and eat and go. Right? Because that's our, that's our lifestyle. That's our mentality right now. So, if you got to choose what... Ex if you had had your choice of what to eat, what is your favorite meal? Another tradition at our house is on your birthday, you get to name what we're having, what the family's having for dinner. So it is your turn to decide what everybody's going to eat. So what is it going to be? Personally, I like a good burger and a beer. Jimmy Buffett and I are going to have a cheeseburger in paradise, and we're going to enjoy it. But if I had to rate how healthy that was, how really good it is for me, I wouldn't get a very good rating on the calorie and fat content. But you know what? That I would like to count the lettuce, tomato, and onion as a vegetable, and maybe even the pickle. But I don't think that dietitians count those, or at least not enough for even one serving, probably. I am going to enjoy my meal, though. It's going to taste really good. But I think that gets at a deeper point 
And that is that we often want to satisfy ourselves or go for that which tastes good, whether or not it's really healthy for us. And it's not just about taste, right? We often do things that feel good in the moment, but may not actually be healthy or safe or good for us in the long run. And I think that's the deeper point. I'm not sure why that is. I don't know what it is about us that does that. Some people like to blame it on the fall, the, the whole Adam and Eve story. Personally, I think that lets us off the hook. It's like saying the devil made me do it. You know, it, it's like it's somebody else's fault. It's something, it, this is beyond my control. When the reality is we all have the ability to make these choices. We just don't always choose what's best. Well, our scripture today is about the Israelites. This comes from a later section in Isaiah. The beginning of Isaiah, Isaiah was warning the Israelites that if they didn't change their ways, if they didn't adhere more to God, then there was going to be a punishment. And in fact, the, first the Assyrians come in and invade, and they destroy the temple in Jerusalem. And this cannot be underrated, okay? Because the Jews believed that God resided in the temple in Jerusalem. So when the temple was destroyed, they didn't know what happened to God. And then they were spread out all over the place. So they were distanced from God, even if God stayed in Jerusalem. This particular passage is from a later, we actually call it Second Isaiah, because we don't think it was actually Isaiah that wrote it, but it was written much later, probably after the Babylonians came in and took over this and conquered the Assyrians. And in that time, these words come as words of hope. God is doing a new thing. God is going to bring the people back together again, and God is going to feed the people. Like a reminder of being in the desert. When they were wandering in the desert, God gave them manna, made manna fall from the sky and water come from the rock. This is a reminder that God will always feed God's people. There's a the line in there near the end that God's saying, but my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. God's idea of us coming together is about everyone having what they need. In God's world, you come and you get drink and you get bread and milk and wine and water at no cost. Everyone will have what they need. Everyone will have equal access. Those with power and wealth will not have special privileges. It's a sort of egalitarian utopia that we're supposed to be, is, is what God's kingdom's about. People with power or wealth will not be wielding it to hold down others. But instead, the power will be shared, will listen to one another and hear all that, that people need. And the needs will be met. I think it's that, it's that ideal that the writers of our Constitution and Decla the Declaration of Independence and Constitution were looking for. They were trying to make it egalitarian. 
but I don't think we've ever made it. I think it's still a goal for us to strive towards where all have equal access and all are welcome. You see, as Christians, well, even as people, humanity was created by God to care for the creation, to care for the natural world and the other animals and and humans. God realized that that care needed to be given in a way that God couldn't. And so God created humanity. And we just messed it up. So God came again. This time God came in the form of a baby to grow into a man to teach us how to live and how to be with one another. But we didn't like him either. This, in, in a couple weeks here, we're going we're gonna to celebrate Maundy Thursday. Where we're going to come together, as I did with the children, and we're going to remember the story. We're going to remember how Jesus came together. And shared that meal. And that was called the Feast of God. I asked the kids, but the question was also for you. Is that, is that, is this what you would call a feast? Maybe our perspective needs to change. Because this isn't, when I get invited to a feast, this isn't what I'm thinking. But yet, it's all we need to survive. I think right now in our world, in our world, in our country, in our community, there are so many people who are hurting, who desperately need to hear these words And to hear the words and stories of Jesus that call us to reach out to those who are not usually accepted by society. Jesus did that all the time. He broke all kinds of barriers by going and touching those who were to be untouchable and eating with those who were not worthy. To offer forgiveness. Because there's a lot of people who do not feel forgiven. And yet God's forgiveness comes over and over and over. And like we explored last week, God's forgiveness is given before we confess. It's already there for us. Sure, it's good to confess. It feels better when we do But you can experience mercy through the bread and the cup. It's there for everyone. There's no more barriers. The church overall has been very good about creating barriers and about saying who's in and who's out. Who can come and who can't. But that's not, that wasn't the point. The church was not created for the church. The church was created to meet the needs of the people. Not the people within the church, but the people outside of the church. The people who still feel excluded. A few years ago, we we voted as a congregation to say that our vision and mission is about sharing Christ's love with all people. So how are we doing that? 
I think we are doing that. I'm, I'm, this isn't a, a, a come to Jesus moment, but how, you know, how are the ways that we're doing that? And in what way, who else is still out there hurting that doesn't know about the grace and mercy that we can receive here, that is available here? The welcome that's available here. Because all are welcome. All are welcome in this place. All are welcome to this table. The UCC slogan, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. How do we live that out? I hope that we take time to be in prayer over that about other ways in which, or other people maybe even, that may come to your mind that you need to say a kind word to or reach out to and invite them to something so that they can know too that this is here for them also. This isn't a private club. God's feast is for all. May it be so. Amen.